Hi, I'm Mary Harrell for TAN Books. More is at stake in the music we listen to or perform than most people realize. So what are you listening to in your car? What hymns are you hearing at mass? And are you ever without those ubiquitous little AirPods in your ears day in and day out? It's time to face the truth of what we're hearing every day. And here to discuss his new book on this topic is Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. He is the author of Good Music, Sacred Music, and Silence, Three Gifts of God for Liturgy and Life. Peter, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Mary, for having me. So, Peter, you're a philosopher, you're a theologian, but also, I don't know if all of our listeners know, you are a composer, you are a conductor, you're a trained singer, you really, you walk the walk and you chant the chant on this topic, you know it so well. So let's go ahead and start with what the problem is. You level a somewhat startling claim uh, early on in the book that you say that just as great classical music is morally and intellectually good for us, conversely, certain forms of music can actually be harmful and downright sinful. Tell us why you make that claim. Yes. So in, in the moral life, there are many, many influences on us, and music is one of them, not the only one. However, it's a particularly important influence on our moral life because music, uh, as all of the philosophers from ancient times through modern times have recognized, has a peculiar power to get under our skin, so to speak, and get right into our emotions, our feelings, our passions, and form them in a likeness of the character of the music itself. Uh, we see this because dance music makes people want to dance. March music makes them want to march. Um, church music at its best makes them want to pray. The, the way the music itself is, and I don't just mean the words, I mean the music, really uh, shapes uh, our character. Um, and that's a, that's a truth that nobody has ever denied, but a lot of people become very uncomfortable when you emphasize that point to them. Um, and yet it's really kind of obvious, you know, if you look at the, the people who listen to heavy metal music, they dress and they act and they talk a certain way. The people who listen to jazz dress and talk and act a certain way. The people who listen to classical music, perhaps, you know, there could be some stereotypes in there, but there's also just a truth that we see about the formative uh, power of, of music. And there are definitely types of music. Um, I would say heavy metal is one of them. Rap is another one uh, where there are serious uh, ethical questions here about what kind of spiritual food are we taking into our souls when we listen to this music? We're, we're asking it to shape us, to make us like itself. Uh, and, and the sentiments conveyed in the lyrics, especially, um, they, they kind of drill into the soul even more deeply when they're combined with music. Mm. I think parents find that when they maybe turn on a song that they listen to in their youth or even currently, and then you turn it on and your children are listening and you think, oh my gosh, this is wildly inappropriate. And I just have heard it for so many, so many years. I didn't yes. even notice anymore. Yes. Absolutely true. And I don't want to paint that with too broad of a brush. You do make allowances for folk music, for music that is appropriate to certain instances or cultures, right? It's not mm -hmm. just totally, it's Mozart all the time, even though that wouldn't be a bad thing. Yes. I would say that um, part of my goal in, in the book is to encourage people to broaden and deepen their musical culture, their musical experience, because we as, as Western um, Christians, Catholics, we inherit the greatest musical and artistic culture that the human race has ever seen. There isn't even anything close to what Christendom has given us. And I'm talking now about everything from Gregorian chant and Byzantine chant through uh, the polyphony of the Middle Ages and of the Renaissance, Palestrina, Victoria, Bird, Talis, these, these wonderful composers, unequaled uh, at writing sacred music, uh, and, and into uh, Bach, Handel, Vivaldi, Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, Mahler, Bruckner, uh, you know, Brahms. I mean, there are so many great composers. Each one of these you could devote your entire life to because they left uh, a, a corpus, a body of work that is comparable, say, to the work of, of Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo or Shakespeare or Dante, right? So these are this is a great heritage we have. And yet the, the musical taste or the musical habits of most people is like a tiny thin line of, of this whole heritage. Um, and in fact, when you look at it, that is when you look at a lot of contemporary or popular music, 
um, it's it's extremely simplistic as music. Mm -hmm. It has very repetitious rhythms. It has really dumb lyrics. Um, the melodies are not at all interesting. Sometimes there isn't even a melody. Um, and oftentimes the styles are, are one of sort of grinding, almost bestial repetition. This is what you hear thumping out of the woofers of so many cars, you know, in, in cities. Uh, and and this is like this is like people eating a diet, a musical diet only of, um, you know, sugar candy or or worse, you know, even poison, perhaps, uh, mm. you know, fast food. I compare it at one point to fast food. You know, if, if all you ever ate was Burger King, you know, you're, you're going to be a very unhealthy person. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is true psychologically and spiritually as well. Well, and so let's go to the, the converse of that. The opposite of that would be Gregorian chant. You go into great detail in the book about the incomparable art form. And I love that you call it an art form. I don't think people always look at a musical category and say, yes, that is art as well. So what about Gregorian chant sets it apart as being uniquely suited to divine worship? You go through eight points that I thought were wonderful. Yes, exactly. Well, I do talk a lot about chant in the second part of the book. The first part is about classical music, although, as you say, I talk about folk music there, too, which I think is is a very important genre, but uh, or genres multiple. <laughs> um, but in part two, where I'm looking at sacred music, what's appropriate for the liturgy, uh, there I, I really I just start where the church herself starts in so many magisterial documents that Gregorian chant is the norm is the perfect uh, exemplar and example of sacred music. Why is that the case? Well, as you said, there are eight characteristics. Uh, the first is the primacy of the word. Gregorian chant um, gives primacy to the word of God, to the, the word of God in scripture. Uh, it, it, it's a musical Lexio Divina, a musical um, interpretation of the word of God as given to us through the liturgy. It, in other words, the music doesn't draw attention to itself, but it draws attention to the sacred words that are being sung. Um, and it does though, so because of the, in a sense, the purity or the chastity of the melodies. It, it's not, ex it's not um, music that jumps up and down and says, pay attention to me. It's music that says, um, submit yourself to the holy word of God and let it form you and and penetrate deeply into you. And the chant, the peacefulness, the tranquility of the chant helps that word to penetrate into our hearts. This is something that happens over a long period of time. We're meant to be hearing this over a long period of time, uh, not just once. If you hear chant once, you might think, oh, that's strange and interesting, but it won't really have an effect on you. It's supposed to be a habitual exposure. Um, the second characteristic is free rhythm. Free rhythm, the chant doesn't fit into a system of beats like duple or triple time. You can't put a meter, a meter to it, like three, four, or four, four. If you if you have musical training, you know what I'm talking about. It can't, it's not like a waltz or a march uh, or a dance. It it fall it, it it has a free rhythm that follows the rhythm of the words themselves, usually from scripture. And this this gives chant its sort of ethereal, free floating character, right? It just it sort of meanders and and almost soars like a bird in the sky, right? And that's part of the it has this effect on us then of of um, of of liberating and freeing us from worldly concerns. Uh, that's very much the effect of this free rhythm. Um, unison singing, typically Gregorian chant is sung. Everybody is singing the same melody at the same time. It's not music in parts like polyphony or just about every other later form of music, um, but it's it's music. It's unharmonized, unaccompanied often, and and just one unison voice. Well, what's important about that? That represents the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church speaking and praying um, una voce with one voice, right? And that means everybody can sing along with the chant, either in the choir or even in the congregation. Uh, it's it's um, so it, that's that's the that's important. The unison singing, um, the unaccompanied vocalization. I kind of touched on that. The fact that that oftentimes there are no instruments involved. It's just the God-given instrument of the human voice that is meant to be emitting the chant. And that's how it was for many many centuries. There was no organ accompaniment, and still to this day, I would say in most churches. When the chants are sung, there's not organ accompaniment. It's just the sound of the human voice, the only instrument God created every one of us with, right? Um, I'll just mention the others briefly. Modality, 
uh, is unusual about chant. Chant isn't written in major keys or minor keys, but it uses an older system of, of tonality by which the melodies themselves um, have, have, a, have a unique set of shapes that we call the modes. Uh, and major and minor keys are like modes, but there are eight modes, not just two. Um, and so uh, a chant then has a kind of strange sound to the modern ear because for hundreds of years we've been using only major and minor keys in Western music. But chant comes from an ancient culture that used eight different scales for the music. Um, so that, that gives it a, a, a unique a, a aspect or frame. And these modes have different emotional characters as well. Some of them are more bright, uh, others are darker. Some of them seem very incomplete. Um, they, 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 they frustrate in a way our musical expectations. And so what they actually lend themselves to is conveying something like the longing for eternity or the longing for the divine, um, precisely because the chant doesn't end in a sort of neat and tidy cadence, the way that a lot of later music does. You know, um, Anonymity is a trait of Gregorian chant. We don't know the names of, well, with very few exceptions, we don't know the names of any of these composers who wrote thousands of these gorgeous chant melodies. Right. So there's no cult of personality. There's no um, celebrity status that somebody gets to have as a performer or as a composer of chant. It's just a big anonymous body of work produced by countless monks over all of these centuries. And what a wonderful thing that is, too. You know, it's, it's like the liturgy itself. So much of the liturgy, we don't know where it came from. It just sort of it, it was there. It emerged from faith and from prayer. You know, um, emotional moderation. This is very important about chant, too, that it is emotional. It's not devoid of emotion, but the, um, the emotions are subtle and calm and pure. Um, you know, it does express joy. It does express sorrow. But it doesn't express, you know, um, uh, the extremes that, say, a romantic opera or perhaps a modern pop song is trying to, to get at, right? It's more subtle. Um, and the last thing is maybe the most important in a way, uh, the last trait of chat, which is that it's unambiguously sacred. And the reason I say that is the chant arose exclusively for use in the sacred liturgy of the church. It's never had any other purpose than that for its entire history. And we're going on now, I mean, we're talking about a heritage that's at least 1,500 years old. We don't even know when the chants began. They just so, they suddenly show up in the history historical record. As long wow. as people have been liturgizing, they've been singing, you know? Well, that leads me to the next question then of another part you had in your book that I wasn't, something I hadn't even considered before, that we sing liturgical texts. We don't just speak them. And there is a strange disconnect of when, um, if you attend a, a Novus Ordo Mass, <laughs> you hear sometimes the Mass parts just spoken if there's not, you know, musical accompaniment for the day, the, the pianist is not there or whatnot. And it sounds rather strange. And I never thought about that. But why do we sing liturgical texts and not just speak them? Could you go into that for a little bit? Yes, for sure. Well, there are many reasons for doing this. And, and it's important to note that for the first thousand years of Christianity in East and West, when, when there was an undivided church before the Great Schism, that tragic event, um, all liturgy was sung. Public liturgy was always chanted. Um, and it was only in the second millennium in the West that the idea of a private or a low mass uh, developed. And it developed mainly because in monasteries that had dozens or even hundreds of monks who were priests, all they, they could only do one collective mass per day as a community, one chanted mass. There was no such thing as concelebration. That's a novelty. Um, and so these priests, they wanted to, to offer the holy mass as a personal devotional act and as an act on behalf of the church living and dead. And so that's how the low mass developed as an opportunity for these monks to pray a private quiet mass in the morning prior to their communal sung liturgy. But why do we sing the texts? Why is that the norm? It's First of all, it's because it elevates the text to a higher level. Whenever we sing something, we are elevating it. Um, we, we When we sing a song, uh, a ballad, 
we're elevating the topic of that ballad. When when we sing a mass, we're we're giving a sort of consecrated um, and and ornamented and beautiful um, costume in a way to the words. We're treating them with even greater love and respect, and they move us more deeply when they're sung. They're more memorable to us. Um, people, there have been studies that show that people memorize things 10 or 20 times faster when they're sung uh, as opposed to when they're just merely recited, right? And this is why the advertisers love jingles. They, they know the jingle is going to get stuck in your head. You'll never forget it for, for as long as you live. Um, also, when, when words are sung, they actually have a way of carrying through a space more. If, if, if somebody just says at mass, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, it's kind of stale. The, the words just sort of drop there, like like you're just dropping something. But if if the priest says Dominus Vobiscum, and then the whole church chants Et cum Spiritu Tuo, very simple. Anybody can chant that, but suddenly it has this monumentality to it, right? It has a real solidity and strength um, and and power that that you're not going to get when you merely recite the words. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I keep going back to children just because I have so many of them, but that sticks with them too. When we want our children to to memorize something or learn it, we often give it to them in a song. And in the same way, my kids will come home from mass and I'll hear them chanting in the living room. And I love that because something has stuck with them. Yes. Um, the book is not totally about music. It is about, about silence as well. And um, I think any Catholic reader today is probably familiar with Cardinal Robert Sarah's book, The Power of Silence. And so what is the context of the silence you're writing about in this book? And was his book uh, any influence on your own work or thinking on the topic? Yes, absolutely. Well, Car Cardinal Sarah is certainly an influence, I think, on any of us who love the liturgy and who treasure silence in particular. Um, the si silence in the liturgy is something that is more distinctive to the Western or Latin tradition. The East with which which I love, I'm very familiar with with Eastern Christian liturgies, especially the Ukrainian Greek Catholic um, Church and its liturgical rites. Um, they sing everything. It's very extroverted. There's hardly any silence. You know, you don't have a moment to think to yourself, and that's fine. That's their tradition. That's their custom. It's very effective because they're leisurely about it, and they they spend they take lots of time and they sing. They repeat all kinds of songs, and it kind of it's like you sort of get steeped in it. You're sort of like you're simmered and, and stewed in all this chanting. And I think that that has a kind of mesmerizing mystical effect as well. It works within their own heritage. In the West, for various reasons, which I won't go into right now, the, the liturgy developed more room, more space for silence, for, for sometimes quite considerable periods of time in which the ministers at the altar, let's say the priest, deacon, subdeacon, they're busy doing something. They're praying their own prayers uh, quietly. And in the rest of the church, everybody is kneeling and praying silently uh, and uniting themselves in a very deep and, and fervent way with the overall offering of the liturgy that's taking place. Um, we've all experienced this if, if we've attended the traditional Latin mass and we've and we've we've seen or we've heard, if you can put it that way, um, the the uh, not only the chants uh, and the readings, the antiphons, the prayers, but also this great silence during the canon, during the the, the Roman canon. You know, so from the point of view, from from the point when the Sanctus dies out to all the way through the per omnia secula seculorum and the and the amen at the end it's this oasis of of silence and in in, in that oasis we find ourselves um i think drawn even more deeply into the mystery of the sacrifice of christ on the cross and the love and the mercy with which he offered himself on the cross and the adoration that we owe him in his real presence in the most holy sacrament. All of that is heavily accentuated paradoxically by the absence of speaking and the absence of singing. It's what I call a sonic iconostasis. There's a kind of veil that we mm -hmm. lower over this awesome mystery um, in order, because we almost have a sense that no words could do justice to this and no music either. Even though the Roman canon is full of 
beautiful and majestic language. We can follow that language if we want to in the in the missal, and and I do sometimes, and I hope everybody does. But there's something about the experience of that cavernous, awesome silence around the cross at Calvary, you know, with Mary and John, that I think is it's so poignant, um, and it's it's one of the things that I think um, it 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 prompts people to pray with deeper fervor at that point in the mass. You have a line on silence in the book, which I absolutely loved. It said that silence is music's necessary counterpart and prayer's inseparable companion. I, and I, I love that dichotomy. Have you always cherished silence in your life and in the liturgy, or was this something you came to later on in life when you had a greater appreciation for the Latin mass? That's a good question. Um, and, I, and I always want to be careful uh, not to reconstruct past events, you know, to, to sort of, you know, uh, read into the past what I've figured out later. Um, so I, I won't, I won't pretend that I've always appreciated silence. I don't think, uh, and I, I actually don't think that human beings can appreciate silence until they've become more mature and had more life experience. Um, you know, just like little children are squirmy all the time and it's hard for them to sit still and they have to right. learn how to sit still. And then later on, going beyond that, they have to learn to read a short book, then a middle sized book, then a long book. And then they need to go from literature to 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 nonfiction and maybe even philosophy. So, there, I mean, human we, we our education takes place over a long time and it goes from phase to phase to phase. Uh, and, and really the sky's the limit, you know, because you can keep moving. And I think something similar happens with regard to music and silence and prayer, all of those, in that we, we start with rather simple, uh, maybe almost even animal habits or tastes or inclinations. And we have to grow through good habits, through habit habituation and a good environment um, to a greater and greater appreciation of beautiful music of the value of silence, um, of prayer forms that are not merely vocal, right? Everybody starts by memorizing the Our Father, the Hail Mary, et cetera. We pray the rosary, but we're supposed to eventually, without leaving that behind, of course, we're supposed to graduate also to, you know, being able to sit still in church and not be saying words, but just sit there and just be in God's presence and sort of shut, almost wait, shut off the talking, you know, <laughs> and just be in God's presence. Right. And, and that's what happens often in adoration and Eucharistic adoration, that people can reach a point where they're just content to be there, you know, mm -hmm. like that wonderful story where the curé of ours, you know, asked that old man, what are you doing here for so long in church? And he just says, you know, I look oh. at him and he looks at me, you know? He looks at me. Um, and so that's, that's why I think all of, that's what my experience has been, that it's taken a long time to, to appreciate certain things in life, um, including silence. Um, and yet we all need to strive for that. So true. And as we, as we wrap up here, it's been a wonderful conversation. Um, but you attend a strikingly beautiful church in Lincoln, Nebraska. I've been there myself. It's such a beautiful, holy, mm -hmm. calm, quiet place to pray. So beautiful. It's served by the priests of the fraternity of the FSSP. Um, and it's striking that it's filled every Sunday, every mass with young families. And, you know, if you took a, an average of the attendance of the average age, it would be like five because there's yeah. so many babies. There's so many little kids, too. Um, so what do you see for the future of the church, for, for the hope of these families attending the Latin mass and of being simmered in that silence, in that holy music, in that chant? Um, every single weekend and Holy Day. Does that give you hope for our future as a church? Yes, it, it does. Because in fact, what, what we're seeing in a place like St. Francis of Assisi or any of the the parishes run by the Fraternity of St. Peter, the Institute of Christ the King, you know, or, or diocesan uh, priests who offer the Latin Mass, what we're seeing there is a rediscovery, a recovery of some of the church's most powerful evangelistic and missionary and catechizing uh, and spiritually formative tools, right? These are these are tools that the church, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, developed over centuries and centuries, and they're tested. They're time tested. They've been proved sevenfold, like silver in the fire, um, and and they work. They work very well. There, these are the tools with which the Catholic Church 
conquered the world, the Roman Empire, the barbarian kingdoms, uh, you know, and, and all of the continents with the missions, right? So of course they're effective. Of course they work. We just have to persevere in prayer, in fidelity, in, in, um, and, and in patience, because we're living at a time when there are people who just don't, they have psychological barriers uh, to the recovery of Catholic tradition. Um, they see it as something which is completely passe, um, something that is that belongs to the past that has nothing to say to us anymore. The opposite is the truth is is the truth, but they have these barriers or impediments inside to seeing that. And we need to pray for them and for ourselves and just keep doing what we're doing, brick by brick, you know, chant by chant, child by child, right? This is this is how Catholicism will be rebuilt in the future. And amen to that. Again, the book is good music, sacred music, and silence. Three gifts of three gifts of God for liturgy and for life. You can hear find it here on tanbooks.com or at your local Catholic bookstore, a wonderful addition to any home Catholic library and totally accessible to even a regular reader and a mom just like me. Encourage everyone to pick up a copy. Dr. Kwasniewski, thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Pre appreciate it.